William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Temperature affects your daily life. No question about it. A lot of people are allergic to cold, and a lot of cold stiffs are allergic to a certain overheated place. The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Barry Craig speaking. Robin Hood was a character in fiction. No such character except in some writer's brain. Yet every now and then, a live descendant of Robin Hood happens in real life. Some screwball who steals from the rich to give to the poor. Like a certain bank embezzler, I had the misfortune to be handed as an assignment one day. A small bank in a town with an under 20,000 population. The bank manager, a shriveled up little guy named Woolsey, explained why he had reached way into New York for an investigator. Well, my hope is that you can prevent a terrible scandal, Mr. Craig. By catching this absconding teller? Yes, Kirk Dennis. Scandal, you said, in a tone of voice like the banshees were after you. The banshees are. You don't know Echo Corners. Tell me about your quaint little town. Well, you've heard of mountaineer feudists. The bloody Hatfields and McCoy. Here in Echo Corners, we have that precise situation. Barbarism and hatred that divides the town. This side against that side. On election day, we have the state militia to prevent feelings boiling over. Civil disorder. News of the embezzlement gets out, I'll be crucified. But a theft happens in the best of towns. Yes, yes, but the blame is mine for Dennis' flight with bank money. How come? Dennis is a, a sort of protege of mine. I, I've sponsored the man. I met with severe criticism and I gave him a job in the bank. Criticism? Why? Dennis had been involved in uh, some scrape prior to the bank job. A uh, scrape like? An automobile accident and property damage. Well, that's only a civil case. No, no, criminal. Dennis was accused of hitting and running from the scene. Sentence was suspended, however. Uh, one half of the town had a gimmick for reading Dennis out of organized society. Yes, and then I foolishly hired him in the face of such criticism. Find him, Mr. Craig, and recover the money before our next regular audit period. Well, if I do, uh, what will you do? Well, I'm not sure. I, I think merely restore the money to our safe, wash my hands of the affair. You're thinking unlawfully. I, I, I'm confused and, and, frankly, terrified. My life is in this bank. I came to it as a youth. And then my sensitive status in Echo Corners, I'm a town committeeman. And two, my, my, my family, my boy in college. Okay, let's just say you're right now confused. If I catch Dennis and recover the loot, you can then take a calmer view of your plans, uh, your responsibilities. Yes, you're... A... You're an understanding man, Mr. Craig. Well, give me the facts on Dennis. His background, cronies, family here in Echo Corners, if any. How much was stolen, his habits, uh, stuff I can work with. An embezzlement temporarily hushed up. Woolsey had his executive neck way out. I got all the facts you knew about young Kirk Dennis and then went to work. Work kicked off pleasantly enough. In a farmer's market, the annual Spring Jubilee Bazaar was the occasion for the crowds and music. The booth I was especially interested in had a spinning wheel with numbers on it. You placed your dime bet, and the chances on the big wheel were 39 to 1 that you couldn't possibly All win. right, folks, place your bets. A selection of $5 in merchandise awaits the lucky winner. Look the shelves over and pick your prizes. Place your bets. The doll hustling bets was Jenny Smith. She'd been wild about the vanished embezzler and vice versa. Last call before the wheel spins. I got my dime down on number 13. And here she spins. And it's number 13. Whose dime is on 13? That's mine, miss. Okay, you win $5 worth of merchandise, mister. What's your selection? Anything on the shelves this is? Uh, the lower shelf. Oh. All right, I'll, 
I'll take that gooseberry pie. That's one dollar's worth. What else? Four dollars worth of your time. Oh, a fresh guy, hmm? No, an investigator. Lean close. I'll whisper something in your shell-like ear. Kirk Dennis. Kirk! Keep it a whisper if you still care about the guy. Meet you where? Uh, my car's parked on the north lot. It has a fare banner attached to the aerial. You'll recognize it. We can talk sitting in my car. Talk and eat? I've been years pining for a homemade gooseberry pie. When the pie was devoured, we talked. What's this about? Ten to twenty years. Ten to twenty years? The time friend Kirk will spend in the clink for absconding with bank money. Kirk? You sound like you put embezzlement past him. Oh, it's just impossible to believe that Kirk would do anything criminal. The jails are full of the nicest people. Look, if what you say about Kirk is true, why haven't I heard about it? Confidentially, it's not yet been broadcast. It's top secret. Kirk can help himself. Reappear with the money. Mitigate his crime. Are you trying to contact Kirk through me? If you know where he is. Well, I don't. Well, you two kept company. We dated. Does that make me an accomplice? Of course not. You're only a corn-fed country girl with nothing in your head but the purest thoughts. You never pine for big city lights, spangled evening gowns, mink, and all that sinful stuff. It never enters your head. Hardly ever. <laughs> Thanks for frankness. Have you any idea where Kirk might go? No. Any place he dreamed of shoving off to? Dreamed? A wish you might have heard him make, uh, especially when Echo Corners got him down and cramped his style. You know, uh, idle talk, the, the fantasies people go in for. Oh, sure. Madagascar, Hong Kong, the South Pole. Kirk always talked like a frustrated adventurer. He only read travel books and railroad timetables. Are you really going to all those places in search of Kirk? Detectives sometimes make tracks. But I'll try it right here in Echo Corners before renewing my visa. Now, if Kirk Dennis gets in touch with you, will you contact me at once? For Kirk's sake, Jenny. Where are you staying? The Blue Moon Inn. I still find it incredible that Kirk stole bank money. Local boy makes good. The next fellow in my checklist found me before I found him. On South Main Street, as I was strolling by, he came tearing out of a barber shop with lather still caked on one cheek. Hold on there, stranger. You're just the man I want to see. My hunch is you're just the man I want to see. You answer the description given to me. The description? Flap ears, a bald dome, and a big mouth. See, Samson Kovacs is the name. Then you're it. And you're some adult painted shoe fly cop flown in from the east, I'm privately informed. Keep bellowing, you'll blow a gasket. Do we continue this interview right smack on Main Street? Come back over to the firehouse and walk in front of me. I never turn my back to a stranger. I learned that reading about the Texas Rangers. Back at the firehouse, Kovacs raced his tongue in high speed. I'm privately informed a certain whelp whose name is better unmentioned. Kirk Dennis. Wash him out. That this thieving scoundrel took to his heels with a certain parcel of money. Eighty thousand dollars. You keep interrupting. You talk all around the landscape. Some brass tacks, huh? Who keeps you informed? Kovacs is not without friends. And not without suckers. Is that a merely reference to the venerable trade I pursue? Money lending and bet taking isn't a trade, Squire Kovacs. It's a racket. What is a harness race without a wager? How about the money lending? And at a rate of interest that begins at 20%, I'm reliably told. You've been listening to my yellow liver detractors. How much did Kirk Dennis owe you? I held his paper for, um, $5,000. Plus 20%. That makes the debt 6000 It is an infamous lie. What is? That I put Dennis up to violating his trust as a bank teller. That Dennis stole money at my behest. Now, who said that? Well, there have been whisperings. When did you last see Kirk Dennis? Not for a moon. If he skipped to Echo Corners in the county, you're stuck with $6,000 worth of uncollectible paper. How about that? A man dishonors his debt to me, I'd follow him to the ends of the earth. Then start traveling after Dennis. No such emergency. Dennis has performed with commendable regard for me. Meaning? An envelope left under my door. Two nights ago, was it? Yes. The night of the Mad Hatter's Ball. In the envelope, his debt paid in full. 
Dennis left an envelope containing $6,000 under your door. He did? Stolen bank money. I dispute and deny that. You'll have to give it back. Not without a legal struggle. It only went to prove the big cities had no monopoly on shopsters. The next item on my checklist into a missing bank teller's personality and background was Kirk Dennis's uncle. Named, interestingly enough, Moses Crooker. I got there at dusk to the tune of barking hounds anxious to improve their bite on strangers, bums, and detectives. My information was that Dennis had lived with his uncle. Yes? Moses Crooker? Yes, me. My name's Barry Craig. All right if I visit a while? Welcome, man. So was out for a weary traveler. Huh. Sweet music to my ears. What's that? So far, I haven't found Echo Corners too hospitable. Well, there are those that are and those that ain't. Come in and sit. Yeah, I'm glad you thought to stop. I've been aching for company all day. You have? Just busting to talk to somebody. Am I mistaken, or are you bubbling over with happiness? You ain't never been happier. Not since the cow had triplets. Two things get a man bouncing that high. One's romance. Oh, it ain't that. Since the Pelagra got Emmy, it ain't never been that. The other thing's money. You came into money. I better not be answering that. I hit the nail, huh? You know, I ain't sure I like your prying. But you invited me in to talk. You were busting to talk, you said. Yeah, but I don't like anybody taking the words out of my mouth. Oh, I'm sorry I jumped the gun. Well, if you're going to do your own talking... I must tell you, blow up from the compression. You see this? A tin can. A can for the lard back in my grandfather's time. Well, what about it? What do you see on it? See? Well, rust for one thing. The rust of years. And dirt caked all over it. Where's it been? Buried. Where I turned up a patch this morning to see the corn. Buried and you dug it up? Buried where it's been long before I was born. An old tin can for lard, but it's a pot of gold. Buried treasure, and you're the lucky finder. In my hour of need, the good Lord saw fit. Can I get a squint into the contents of the can? You can, so you can see what I saw. And uh, so I'll know I ain't been dreaming. Well, what do you see? Money in bills. The can's packed with money. Five thousand dollars, I counted. You dug it up, you said. Out in the corn patch. I've got a little shock for you, Crooker. A shock? The can's older than sin, all right. As antique as your memory of your grandfather. But the money isn't. The money ain't? The money's soggy and soiled a little, but it's comparatively new money. Look at the modern size of the bills. The 13-figure serial numbers on it. Practically fresh out of the mint. All of it. Fresh? You say? Fresh? Crooker. He'd fainted dead away. He lay on the floor like a guy who'd won the sweepstakes, only to have his horse declared disqualified after victory. When old Moses Crooker came out of his faint, he tried to make an argument of it. My grandfather lived right here on this same farm. A miser, people said him to be. Rich and miserly. And when he died, he left only a few pennies in this house. Now, he had his fortune somewhere. But you haven't found it. Face up to it, Crooker. Banknotes like these in the can just weren't in circulation in Grandfather's time. Well, then it's a mystifying thing. Not so mystifying. Somebody buried new money in an old can on your property. But now, does that make sense to you? Buried it here, possibly, for you to find. Tell me, how deep did you have to dig? Oh, maybe 18 inches. Shallow. And ground you probably turned over every spring, huh? Yeah, to seed the corn. Then you were meant to find the 5,000. Somebody who knew planting and farming procedure around here buried that can. Or did I mention coming in that I was a detective? 
No, you, <clears throat> you didn't say. A detective looking for a bank teller who took off with $80,000 in cash. Your nephew, this is. You're looking for Kirk. I am. And I'm yanking the welcome mat from under you. Get. Sure. Uh, that rifle loaded? You'll be feeling the buckshot as you go. I said Echo Corners was downright inhospitable. With the baying hounds back in my ears, I tried quitting the area fast. Uncle wished me Godspeed. Being half blind, he aimed right at me. First stitch I found, I jumped in. Nothing like a foxhole during battle. I made a progress report to my bank manager client, Woolsey, on his insistence. Well, the news can't keep much longer. The sheriff's been around talking snide. Why not let the news out and stand up to it? I'm afraid. I'll be blackened and shamed. I'll lose the bank. You mean your job in the bank? I'll be voted out. Well, some of the loot's been distributed. 6000 to Kovacs to buy up Dennis's IOUs. 5000 left for Uncle Crooker to feather his old age. To lift the mortgage? My bank holds a $5,000 mortgage on the Crooker place. Oh, a touch of Robin Hood in your missing teller. Pay the bank back with its own money? Well, that's double thievery. And the cream of the jest. Have you any news of Dennis? Something you maybe picked up on the Echo Corners grapevine? Well, it said he was seen camping in Whitehead Park last night, boiling a kettle over a campfire and settling for the night. Who saw him? Clem Hobie. A reliable witness? No, Hobie's the town drunk. He had the farmers chasing a four-legged ghost two months ago. A whack then, huh? Whitehead Park. Is it just a park? Woods and thickets and swampland. Four miles of it, north and east to the county line. Man could hide there without anybody the wiser. I see. Well, cheerio. Look, Craig, I'm relying on you to save me from being dishonored and persecuted. A uh, tall order, but I'm out punching. I took to the woods just to familiarize myself with the terrain in case I did have to flush a fugitive out of them. Whitehead Park looked like African bush country, very dense, very restful. A good spot for a long sleep, voluntary or otherwise. Mine happened otherwise, by will of the above. <clears throat> a weight dropped from the skies. Face up, flat on the ground, I... Got a look at the mighty sleep giver. A man up in the trees with another rock in his hand, the size of the one he'd already crowned me with. I couldn't make out the man's face. My eyes weren't that good. <laughs> Go to sleep in the woods. You never know where you wake up. When I looked my new surroundings over, my first guess was that I was in jail. But your eyes play tricks for a while after you've been beamed. So I took a second look. Same conclusion. I was still in jail. Able to talk now, stranger? I'll check. Dabba, 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 dabba. Yeah. I can talk fine. You're under arrest. I've noted, same. If I read your badge correctly. I'm the sheriff here in Echo Corners. And the charge against me? Vagrancy, suspicion of chicken stealing, sleeping in Whitehead Park where a deputy found you. We don't let bums hang around here long, stranger. So why aren't you leaving town? Hmm? I insulted you. Add a new charge to the old ones. All right, what's my punishment? I'm riding you to the county line and booting you across it. What if I cross back on that county line? You could walk into a shooting. But if I'm not a vagrant? I say you are. With $400 cash in my wallet? Yeah, I'll show you. Say. Something wrong? My wallet's been lifted. You're claiming you were robbed? I'm claiming maybe you took it. You're accusing the sheriff of stealing. Let's just say confiscated it. So you could declare me a vagrant and boot me out of Echo Corners. That's funny talk. You know who I am and why I'm here. You're that half of the town that wants the bank manager, Woolsey, out on a limb. 
in disgrace and bounced out of the bank managership and off the town committee. You don't want me to catch a crook for him. If I admit to it? Deny it and I'll call you a liar. Give me my wallet and let me out of here. Wolsey ain't worth your time. Him suppressing the theft and mocking the law in Ecker Corners. Wolsey's just a worried man. I'm sheriff here, but Wolsey brought you in from the east. So that's your real gripe, huh? Look, Wolsey had a right to hire a private cop. And with the sample of your tactics I've just had, I don't blame him. I'm advising you to go home, Mr. And I'm advising you to go... Well, go find out who beamed me in Whitehead Park this afternoon. My wallet. In my desk. I'll give it to you on your way out. Dennis's girl, Jenny, tried mighty hard to be elusive. I spent half a day looking for her. And I found her where you'd never expect a corn-fed doll with a big city glare in her eyes to be. Home, washing dishes yet. My brother Will had a birthday party. Now you're doing the dishes. I'm a slave. I dream of breaking a lot of them. Obey that impulse. I will. Can't break more than one. My people can't afford it. I like family solidarity. But I can break Will's head, the slob making me clean up after him. I just love family solidarity. You're sappy. Talk to me about Amour. I got nothing to say about Kirk. Then I have something to tell you. What? Since we last spoke, you've gotten money from Kirk. Money? (laughs) You're crazy. Analytical. It figures Kirk also got money to you. He got money to a creditor, to his dear uncle. Why would his generosity of spirit stop at you? You, the girl he loved. Come on, Jenny. Except stolen money, the only change of scene you'll ever get is the big house for delinquent ladies. You don't know Kirk actually stole from the bank. It seems fairly certain. $80,000 is missing. Well, still, you don't know Kirk had anything. How much did Kirk get to you? $2,000. The note said for me to buy a wardrobe and a valise. A valise? To travel where with? The note didn't say I was to wait for another note. How has the note and the money gotten to you? Left in my mailbox. Look, Kirk could have given me that $2,000 from his own savings. Useless to wriggle, Jenny. Kirk didn't have any savings. He was in hock for $5,000 to a moneylender. Sorry, doll. You'll have to disgorge. I loathe, detest, and despise you. (laughs) Now, Jenny, listen carefully. It figures Kirk will be in touch with you again. He'll give you your travel plans and destination. Where to join him with that new valise. I want to know what his message is the minute you get it. I'm not sure I'll let you know. For Kirk's own sake, protect him from himself. You will, Jenny. You're at heart a corn-fed girl raised on Sunday meetings and the Ten Commandments. You'll put temptation behind you. I'm going to break another dish. Jenny wrestled the devil and won. She put temptation behind her. She told me so in a phone call to where I was staying, the Blue Moon Hotel. Barry Craig, a stranger in paradise. Hello. This is Jenny. Dear Jenny. Go jump in the lake. Only in a sweetheart dive. Meet you in a bathing suit. Now, finger Kirk for me. I'll hate myself. There was another note in my mailbox this morning. Instructions on where you were to join him? Yeah. Where? Tomorrow noon in Boston. I'm to be standing outside a hotel, just standing until Kirk comes by in a car. What's the name of the Boston Hotel? It's a French name I can't pronounce. Well, try pronouncing it. Uh, Chateau Paraquet. Chateau Paraquet. Misplaced hotel. Why isn't it in Paris? It blew over to Boston in a high wind. Bless you, Jenny. You're a bulwark of justice. I'm a dope. No, I'll never get out of Echo Corners. You will. How? Nobody lives forever. Ring off, doll. I've got work to do. Do handsprings and pull rabbits out of hats? Some clients aren't satisfied. They insist it's a lousy show, as my client did. Why, you let Kirk Dennis escape Echo Corners. Did you expect me to police the whole county? But your methods have been self-defeating. Just how, Wolsey? Your liaison with Jenny. 
The one real contact to Kirk. You handled it abominably. Your beef being? Only Jenny could have led you to Kirk, given enough rope lulled into a sense of false security. But you were concerned with the girl's morals. You should have kept Jenny under surveillance, but never approached her. Meaning I should have let her go meet Kirk in Boston and then nabbed a pair of them? Yes, at the point of their rendezvous. Now Dennis will disappear into the world. We'll have no clue at all to his whereabouts. Would you be very surprised if I said I do have a clue to Dennis's whereabouts? You have? If I said I don't think Dennis is in Boston or anywhere, but right here in Echo Corners? But I don't... Would a fugitive thief be stupid enough to expose his whereabouts to a girl he knows must be under police control here in Echo Corners? Well, a man in love might... Not in my book. Anyhow, not this soon after the theft. Not with the case red hot and blazing. And I've got more ideas, Wolsey. Yes? About Dennis's lavish handing out of money. Six thousand and five and two to Jenny. That's thirteen thousand out of eighty stolen. But all strictly percentage philanthropy. The crook still has sixty-seven grand all to himself. What did you do with that dough, Wolsey? I do with the money? Don't let's drag this out. Your crime is showing like Casey's red flannel nightshirt. You slip notes and letterboxes. You hand it dough around like Robin Hood, only to support your baloney claim that Kirk Dennis stole the money. But the net you kept is a very tidy sum. Now, Craig, think. Kirk Dennis fled. Yeah, I know. And that little disappearance gimmick is what ties the noose around your scrawny neck. When did Echo Corners have their last hanging? Oh, Craig, you're insane. Wise. Wise to you. Theft and murder. You did both. Okay, if you're going to make it tough to find the corpse of Kirk Dennis. Uh, who? Who are you telephoning? The sheriff. He feels left out of it. I'm inviting him, deputies and all, to turn the town and county inside out, looking for the remains of the late Kirk Dennis. The next morning, I was out with the hounds. Friendly hounds this time, in the wood. Dear old Whitehead Park, the whole four miles of it. What was I doing? Helping a posse look for a stiff. Jenny was along, blubbering. <laughs> Poor Kirk. I said Echo Corners holds nobody forever. <laughs> Craig, I want to apologize for... So get down on your knees, Sheriff. In the mud? When the dogs stopped barking, I figured they'd come across Kirk Dennis. They had. He was in a shallow ditch. Not four feet from where I'd conked out the day before. I'd been sleeping side by side with the dead and hadn't known it. The things a confidential cop does for a measly living. You have been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, The Embezzler, was written by John Robert. Next week, it's the strange story titled The Schemers, about which Barry Craig has this to say. Next week, three adventurers in search of a bankroll find money offers no kick if they're too dead to enjoy it. Good night, folks. See you next week. The National Broadcasting Company has just brought you William Gargan, starring as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Featured in the role of Jenny was Terry Keene. Don Pardo speaking. It's another exciting dragnet adventure tonight on the NBC radio network.